Everyone, let's start by wishing peace in our hearts. Whenever we hear the word Christmas, a couple of images come into our minds. Gifts, the Christmas tree, lighting of candles, singing. And the more time passes by, the more rituals we follow without understanding why. And the problem with following a ritual is that eventually you will forget the, rain, the main reason why are you celebrating the date. Therefore, all rituals become detrimental to the real purpose of why we stop to celebrate this particular date. We all exchange gifts. Do you know why? We all bring a Christmas tree into our house. Do you know why? We all eat a lot. And on a particular night, which is the 25th, the music's still on, right? Yeah. Therefore, we must ask ourselves, what's the reason why do we stop this particular night to do those things? The Christmas tree was first celebrated by Martin Luther. Who was Martin Luther? Martin Luther was a Catholic priest. After leaving his city and going to Rome, he noticed all the abuse from the Catholic Church. Therefore, he wanted to protest everything that was wrong with that branch of religion. Therefore, he wrote 96 theses, 96 protests against the Catholic Church. And that's how Protestantism was born. And the story goes that one night, Martin Luther, he was outside of a house on a Christmas night contemplating the stars. And he noticed how the stars were twinkling through the tree branches. And he thought that was such a beautiful scene that he wanted to repeat the same scenario inside his house. So he cut a small tree, he brought into the house, and of course, back in those days, you had no electricity. So instead of lights, as we have today, he put candles around the tree to symbolize the tree that he had seen on the outside and the stars. So this is why, until today, we bring a Christmas tree into our house. Now, why do we exchange gifts? Certain people believe that the reason why we exchange gift is because the three wise men, they brought gifts to Jesus. Myrrh, gold. But in reality, we have someone that is more responsible for creating the tradition of spreading gifts throughout children. And that man is Saint Nicholas who was uh, a German back in the uh, third century. He was a very rich man, and he felt very sorry for the children. So he disguised himself with poor clothes. So no one would notice that he was the one who was doing this. And then he would bring the gifts to the children. Now, there is a soda company who decided to dress Santa Claus with the same colors of their product. Red, black, and white. Which company is this? Coca-Cola. And the propaganda was <coughs> fantastic because it really worked. Whoever designed propagandas, they are always working with association. So when you look at Santa Claus, what do you associate Santa Claus with? with happiness and his bring you a gift. Therefore, if you put 
the same colors on Santa Claus as the soda, whenever you look at the soda, you will feel happiness is coming into you. It's a gift given to you by drinking that soda. This is why we celebrate Santa Claus. And unfortunately, there is a majority of people who don't understand that Santa Claus, it's really a North Pole tradition. Which, what I mean by this is that it's usually on the cold section of the planet. Because where does Santa Claus live? He lives in the North Pole. So now there are some tropical countries, uh, like Brazil, that near the beach, it's 43 degrees, and you have <laughs> and yet you have someone as dressed up as a Santa Claus. It doesn't make any sense. It's just a tradition that they follow, a ritual. And the more rituals we follow, the less moral transformation that we have. Why do we eat so much? And on that particular night, in reality, Jesus was not born on December 25th. The Emperor Constantino, when he decided to make Christianity the official religion of the Roman Empire, he chose a date that was already known for the people. Back in those days, the uh, December 25th was to celebrate the sun, the, the god of sun, and the god of agriculture. Why? Back in those days, our entire lives revolved around agriculture. We take for granted how easy it is for us to get food. You're hungry, you go to the supermarket, and you just buy it. Back in those days, it was very difficult. You counted uh, on the sun's pattern. You counted uh, on winter. You counted on summer. You counted on spring. You sow your seeds, and you watch them carefully for them to grow so you can reap the benefits of your sowing. Therefore, if we had a long winter, it means starvation. Because with a long winter, people wouldn't have the opportunity to reap the benefits of their sowing. So back in, in, in those days, in Europe, they used to celebrate December 25th to praise the god of sun, the god of agriculture. Why? So the winter could be a very short winter. They would praise him uh, with a very big party. They used to exchange gifts and eat a lot in that particular day. They eat so much that they actually had these places around the city called the Vaktima wires. This is an object in which people ate as much as they could and they will force themselves to vomit. And they will vomit at this particular place just to keep eating constantly. Can you believe this? And they exchanged gifts. They exchanged dry fruits. They exchanged anything they could create with their own hands. So this is why we exchange gifts. So in the year 313, Constantino decided that Christianity would be officially the religion of the empire, and he decided a day to celebrate the birth of Jesus. And that date was December 25th, because it was very convenient for the people. So the historians, they try to calculate what specific date Jesus was born. For some, it was in April, for others, it was in May, others in June, because the calendar that we use today is not the calendar used back in those days. You see, Julius Caesar, with all his power and vanity, you know what he decided to do? He decided to create a month for himself. So he inserted the month of July in our calendar. Then came Augustus, and he decided, well, I cannot be without my month. <laughs> and he inserted a month of August into the calendar. And as the inserted month into the calendar, February came shorter and shorter and shorter. So this is why we have fewer days for February, and we have two new months into the calendar. Just trying to calculate all these differences will completely throw us off to a specific date 
when Jesus was born. But the important thing is, is that he was born. So the more we celebrate the rituals, the more we forget the real reason behind Christmas. The story that we usually know about Christmas, the story that we read, it's something like this. It says that Caesar ordered a census in the empire. And that's where we have Joseph and Mary on a trip because everything must make sense to us. And the first question we ask ourselves is, why in the world someone who's nine months pregnant is traveling somewhere? If you're nine months pregnant, you should be staying somewhere <laughs> and don't move. But we have Mary pregnant of nine months traveling from one place to the next. Why? Well, that's because the emperor, he ordered a census. He wanted to count all the people under his power. And only women and children were out. Men were included. In other words, women and children did not exist for the emperor. Only men were counted. And this is the rule of the census. Each individual had to travel to the city in which they were born. And since Joseph was born in Bethlehem, he had to go back to Bethlehem. But now he was located in Nazareth. So can you imagine a trip back in those days? The distance between Nazareth and Bethlehem, it's about 80 miles. Today we do 80 miles in about an hour and 20 minutes, if you're going to 60 miles per hour maybe. If you're breaking the law and you're going to 80 miles per hour, you get that in one hour. But this is a smooth, fast car and excellent condition roads. But back in those days, we didn't have cars, neither roads. What we had was ups and downs of hills, treacherous roads. And this is why Joseph needed an animal to transport Mary. So now, Joseph finds the animal, the donkey, and they start their journey. Can you imagine someone being nine months pregnant, riding an animal? It's just very difficult to understand how they were able to do this. They had to be traveling for a couple of days. 80 miles distance, it's a long distance. So when they arrived at Bethlehem, they were searching for an inn. And they knocked on the door of the first inn, and someone came out of the inn and looked both of them and noticed how poorly dressed they were. They looked starved. They looked very poor. So the person at the inn looked at these individuals and said to themselves, my God, these people had no money to pay for any space in my inn. So he said, no, there are no spaces in my inn. So Joseph felt compelled to find another place. And here it is, knocking on the next door. And once again, the man looks at them and says, well, I'm sorry, there are no spaces for you. And then he did this a couple of times. And each person at the different inn made the excuse that they had no space. Why? Well, because they knew a lot of people would be coming to Bethlehem. And they had to reserve the space for those who could pay more. This is why they kept saying there was no space at the inn. And finally, Joseph had to make a decision. And the decision was he found uh, this a cave, because back in those days it was very normal for animals to sleep in a cave. And this is in winter time. Back in Europe, you, we don't have a heating system. Uh, there is no clothing uh, that's uh, appropriate to handle that kind of scenario. So they had to find a place to go in. So they had uh, this little cave. And the animals used to sleep inside this, in the cave. 
And in some instances, even human beings will sleep with the animals to share the heat from the animals. And this is the place where Joseph uh, found to have Mary given birth. At this moment, the story goes that the heavens opened up and they heard voices of angels singing, Glory to God in the highest heaven, peace on earth, and goodwill towards all. The pastors who were guiding their sheep at this moment heard the voices and came to see this little baby. Now, since this was just a cave, this is not a maternity uh, room in a hospital, Joseph had to find something to place little Jesus to sleep on. So he walked around and there is a place, there is this apparatus where pigs eat from. Uh, the word manger, manger, in, uh, in French, mangiare in Italiano means to eat. So the pigs ate on the manger. So Joseph cleaned up the manger, put some cloths, and that's what he used to put little Jesus' baby to sleep. At this moment, three wise men arrive. In our standards, these wise men would be our scientists today. And they arrived because they used to study the stars. They were uh, uh, wise men because they knew the sciences back in those days. Before they got to see Jesus, before they get to see Jesus, they arrived first by King Herod. And King Herod asked them, three wise men, why are you coming to my kingdom? And they say, well, we'll be studying the stars, and the prophecies are telling us that the king of kings will be born here. Now, King Herod, when he heard that the <coughs> king of kings was about to be born, he told the three wise men, go ahead, find the king of kings, pay homage to him, and then make the same route back and let me know where this king is so I could pay homage to him. In reality, that was a lie. When he heard that the king of kings was supposed to be born there, he felt very envious about it because he was a king himself. So no one was going to take his place. Therefore, he wanted to kill this baby even before he get a chance to be a king. This is why he felt betrayed, because when the three wise men visit Jesus, they have an inspiration not to go back and tell King Herod to flee, because the intentions of Herod were not good. So Joseph also receives an inspiration from the angel, Gabriel and also flee to Egypt. So when King Herod knew that he wasn't able to see this little baby and kill him with his own hands, he ordered his soldiers to kill all children below two years old. Joseph stays in Egypt for a while. Then he receives another inspiration that it was safe to come back. And he goes back to Nazareth. But the first place that he goes to, it was the Temple of Jerusalem, a very special place where Jewish parents were supposed to take their kids. And in this temple, there was a man called Simon. And the old Simon, he was so sure that he wouldn't die before he met the King of Kings. Because the dream of all Jewish people, it was to meet the King of Kings so this man could finally free them from slavery, from the uh, impoverished condition forced by the Romans. So he was so sure that he would meet the little baby, that he would meet the king of Jesus, the king of kings, before he would die. So when he comes in and he's watching everyone arriving at the temple of Jerusalem, he notices Joseph, Mary, and this little baby. The minute he lays eye 
on the little baby. He had an inspiration that this was the king that he expected. So he got little baby Jesus into his arms, and he looked at him, and he looked at the parents, and he said, you are the king of the Jews? You are the king of kings? How come? Where is your political power in order for you to rule the world? And he kept looking at them. You, the king of kings, where is your money to govern the Romans? Where are your battalions to conduct the wars, to free us up? Because look at your parents. They're so poor. You are very poor. And of course, he was asking questions to a baby. And babies, they don't talk. So little Jesus, just like all the babies, kept swinging around his arms. And little Jesus kept pounding on his chest, just moving, just like a, any other little baby. And he kept asking him these questions. And he handed the baby back to Mary. And eventually he died. Simon, when he arrived at the spiritual world, tells Umberto de Campos through Chico Xavier that this little baby did indeed answer Jesus' questions, answer Simon's questions. When Simon was asking him, where is your political influence? Where is your money to rule? Where is your political power? Where are your battalions for the war? When he kept asking him all these questions, and baby Jesus kept knocking on his chest, kept pounding on his chest, Jesus was letting him know that he did not come to govern the conventional power, but he came to govern our hearts. That's the king of kings, and that will be the rule, not a rule by conventional power, but to rule our hearts. Because it will be unconsequential to us to affirm that we have peace on the planet without peace in the individuals. Peace on the planet will be born out when every individual finds peace within themselves. So when we find peace within ourselves, then naturally the world would have peace. And that's the kind of peace, that's the kind of kingdom Jesus came to bring. Now, this story has been completely forgotten. Unfortunately, you, we rarely hear it because uh, the way we celebrate Christmas, uh, it's very unrelated to why we stopped to celebrate Christmas to begin with. What is Christmas? Well, it's the celebration of the birthday of this individual. There are two kinds of birthday here. There is the birthday of the individual per se, but the birthday of the idea that Jesus came to bring. But how do we usually celebrate our Christmas? Well, we celebrate our Christmas in a such a way that it will be very hard for the birthday person to attend his own party. Let's say you have a friend, and this friend, he's allergic to cigarettes. And then he finds all his friends to come to his party. And at his own party, this is his birthday, Everyone is a smoking. Is this a healthy thing? Are we really caring for the birthday individual? Wouldn't this be very disrespectful to the birthday person? Let's say the birthday person. He hates rock music, and everybody brings <laughs> a rock CD for him as a gift. Wouldn't this be very disrespectful? So this particular night that we celebrate Christmas, our parties should at least be one that the birthday person can attend, and that will be Jesus. Ask yourself the question, the parties that we make at our house, can the birthday place, can the birthday individual be welcome at this place? Are we doing exactly what he told us not to do? Everything that he taught us about the attachment from material things, 
don't we stop to celebrate this night attaching ourselves to material things? It's very contradictory when he came to free us up, yet we celebrate the birthday person by attaching ourselves to material things. We exchange gifts, and sometimes there's a lot of fights within this <laughs> exchange of gifts. We call the sacred Santa, right? And this, if you're not very careful, you could be the secret enemy. <laughs> because depending on the amount of price you exchange in the gifts, if you're not buying something with the same value of the other person they bought you, you just bought yourself a secret enemy. We have to be very careful. What about the conversations that we're having around the table? You know, the conversations are, are usually about the, the people who are absent at the table, you know? Uh, the relatives who are not there. Very detrimental conversations uh, to these individuals. And what if you don't have money to purchase because everybody must purchase something. This is the culture we have created around this date. And once someone doesn't have any money, what usually do they buy it? You know, in Portuguese, there is a word to define this. They buy it what we call a lembrancinha. It's a gift that has no function whatsoever. It's something that you placed in your house and has no purpose. It has no function. You look at it, it does exactly what its name it, is, it stands for. It's to remind you of that person because there's nothing <laughs> else that you can do with it. No usefulness. And then we lose the importance of the date itself. Christmas celebrated on the 25th. It's uh, a traditional thing that spiritists will not create a different date just to be different from everybody else. That's not the point. We will still celebrate Santa Claus, we will still celebrate gifts, but as our children grow older, we will teach them the real meaning of Christmas. Because even if we are given another date by the historians, that Christmas was a different date, that Jesus was actually born in April, not in December 25th, that would not change anything. We spiritists, we know about vibration. And vibration is something very powerful. If we have uh, most of the people on the planet celebrating this particular date, that opens up room for a whole magical uh, influence into our lives. So therefore, we're not going to exchange the Christmas date for the simple fact that history has proven us otherwise. We will continue following the tradition, but most importantly, we will try to understand the real meaning behind Christmas. What is Christmas? Christmas is not just a birthday of an individual. It's the birthday of an idea. What is this idea? Well, this is the birth of love, peace, and hope. That's what Jesus stands for. Love, peace, and hope. And until we don't have love, peace, and hope within ourselves, there will not, there will not be any happiness within us. What Jesus represents is, once again, love, peace, and hope. Without these things within ourselves, it's impossible for us to achieve what we all crave for, happiness. Now, to understand what that is, let's find the antonym of each word. What is hope? Hope is the certainty that our tomorrow will be better than today. That's what hope is. Now, what is the opposite of hope? Despair. What is despair? Despair is the uncertainty of tomorrow. If I am in a state of despair, it means that whatever I'm going through today, I will probably create additional problems. I am in a such state of despair that whatever problem that I'm handling today, it seems unbearable, unsolvable. And that's where we usually create more problems bigger than the original one. 
That's what despair do to us. Look. Therefore, hope is to have the certainty that my tomorrow will be better than today. If I have that certainty within me, whatever problem that I'm going through today, it is manageable, it is solvable, it is tolerable. I, I can do this. That's what hope is. Now, what is love? Love is not just a feeling. It's more of an action. Love, it's the opposite of what? Hatred. Now, if you have hatred, it is impossible for one to experience happiness. It's impossible for one, for one to experience peace, harmony, sincerity. So if I don't have love within me, chances are I have hatred within me. And William Shakespeare used to say that when you hate someone, you drink the poison, you expect your enemy to die. It, hatred and love, it is incompatible with one another. So for someone that don't ha doesn't have love within themselves, it means they probably have hatred. And with this, within this hatred, they are constantly suffering. They're constantly sad. They're constantly miserable. Now let's define another word, which is peace. What is peace? Uh, peace, it's usually the opposite of war. And what is war? A state of chaos, a state of uncertainty. So if someone, if someone is experienced peace, it means they are lacking. If someone's experienced war, it means they are lacking peace. Because peace and war are incompatible. Therefore, what Jesus stands for is peace, love, and hope. To have these three things within us, that will be Christmas. It's not a particular day of the year, but a day in which we allow ourselves to experience peace, hope, and love from now on. If we ask Paul, Paul, would you please let us know when was Christmas for you? Paul would not say, well, Christmas was December 25th. Paul would say, Christmas for me was the day where I was seeking for Ananias. I wanted to kill him. And I was in a horse riding to Damascus. And that's where I found Jesus. He appeared to me, and the bright light it scared my horse away, and I fell from the horse. And at that moment, I looked at this individual, and I asked him, Who are you? And he said, I am Jesus, the one that you are seeking. You are Jesus. What should I do with my life? And at that moment, I gave my life to the dissemination of Christianity. For that moment, it was Christmas for Paul of Tarsus. If we ask St. Thomas, when was Christmas for you? This is what he would say. Christmas for me was the day when the apostles told me that Jesus appeared before him. And Thomas is the apostle that doubt everything. So he said, you know what? You're saying that Jesus appeared to you guys. I will only believe that Jesus appeared to you guys if I'm able to see him and I'm able to insert my finger in the holes through his hand. Then I'll believe it. A couple of days pass by, and the apostles are all gathered together. And Jesus appeared. Jesus looked at Thomas and says, Thomas, here it is, go ahead. And can you believe it that he actually went there? Because if I was St. Thomas, that would be enough, you know. But he actually went there. He inserted his finger and uh, he noticed that this was for real. And Jesus says, well, Thomas, you believed because you have seen it. But blessed are those who haven't seen it, yet they believe it. That day was Christmas for St. Thomas. If we ask Peter, Peter, when was Christmas for you? Peter would say, well, Christmas was the day that Jesus told me that I wouldn't listen. I would betray him. He was arrested. The Roman soldiers found me, and when they looked at me, they said, well, we remember you. 
you were together with that man. And then I said, well, I need to protect myself in order to save him. So I said, no, I don't know who Jesus is. But then someone else recognized me. And once again, I said, no, that I didn't know who Jesus was. And a third time, someone comes to me and says, I know who you are. You were together with the man we're about to kill. And I said, for the last time, no, I don't know who that man is. And then I heard the rooster. And the sound of the rooster was so loud that woke up my consciousness. That day was Christmas for me. So when will be Christmas for us? When will we allow hope, peace, and love to be born within us. Because we have kept celebrating this date throughout the years without experiencing the real meaning of Christmas. If we are constantly disturbed, if we allow all small problems to control us, whenever we go, we are constantly finding people to hate. It means that Christmas hasn't happened to us. It means that Jesus is just a name in history which, with no meaning whatsoever. The purpose of Spiritism is to bring the teachings of Jesus back to earth as he was given by Jesus himself. And unfortunately, throughout history, there were many men in power who distorted the message so we couldn't put the message to secondary motives into our lives. The, the message of Jesus, just like any other message, if not kept well by those who disseminate the message, will be distorted. And that's what happened. Back in the 1990s, there was a car here in the US that the American companies wanted to get this car, this particular brand, out of the market. This was the Peugeot car. Remember the Peugeot car? It's a French car. So out of nowhere, people just kept saying that Peugeot gives problem. I mean, it's an excellent car in Europe. It's exported to many places. Yet in here, you kept hearing these things. What happened? People start, stopped buying the car. Eventually, the company had to move out of the United States because they were not making any money. The same thing happened with Jesus' message. Those who were in power over the years, because they couldn't incorporate the message, they kept distorting the message to apply to their own passions. And the meaning of Christmas got completely forgotten. So it's not December 25th. It's a moment that you allow yourself for hope, love, and peace to be born within you. And when that is going to happen, well, that's how we use the Christmas story for. The Christmas stories are full of symbols because all great teachers, when they're born, they are born teaching something valuable. And the first and most important lesson of Jesus is humbleness, is humility. Remember when Joseph kept knocking on each inn to get a room for Mary so Jesus could be born, what they kept hearing, hearing a big no, because those men were reserving the space at the end for people who could pay more, which means they were full of pride. They were full of greed. This is why they didn't allow Mary and Joseph to come at the end, which means if your heart it's full of pride. It's full of greed. It is impossible for hope, love, and peace to be born within you. If our hearts are full of pride and greed, it is impossible for hope, love, and peace to be born within us. The greatest teaching of Jesus as he is born is the lesson of humbleness. Why so much importance to humbleness? What is humbleness? Humbleness is the opposite of pride. What is pride? Pride is to think that we know it all. We know everything. 
proud individual, they never learn anything new. Why? Because they think they know it all. So they, they stop growing. Now, the opposite of pride is humbleness. What is humbleness? Is the self-awareness that there's so much to learn. Humble individuals are constantly learning. This is why the main teaching of Jesus as he's born is humbleness, to be humble. Because without humbleness, there is no other way that we can acquire the other virtues. Humbleness is the foundation to all the other virtues. It is impossible to learn anything new if we think we already know it. Now, there's a great story about Socrates. Socrates, the Greek philosopher. It says that all the other philosophers back in Greece envy Socrates so much. And they were disputing amongst themselves which was the greatest philosopher in Greece. And obviously, Socrates was not involved in this quest because he didn't care who was the greatest philosopher. So all these philosophers, they went to the temple of Delphis to ask the gods through a medium which philosopher was the greatest philosopher of all times. And they are anxiously waiting for an answer, and here it comes. The gods write through this woman that the greatest philosopher in Greece is Socrates. Now, can you imagine their expression <laughs> when they looked at it? Socrates, he's not even here. So they went to the market and searched for Socrates. They found him and said, Socrates, we went to the temple of Delphis and we asked the gods to let us know who is the greatest philosopher of all times. Can you believe they said it's you who is the greatest philosopher? And he stopped for a moment, he thought, and he said, well, that's probably true. He said, what? Yes, it's probably true. Why do you think so? And he says, well, because I think I'm the only one that know that nothing knows. I'm the only one that knows that nothing knows. Because with their pride, they thought they knew it all. The more you learn, the more you understand your amount of your ignorance. What is ignorance? The lack of knowledge. So Jesus' teaching, the beginning, it's about humbleness. There is always room to learn. There is always something new. Anyone can teach us something good. That's humbleness. Without humbleness, impossible to experience peace, love, and hope. Now, how can I experience peace, for example, when I think I know it all? When I think I know it all, I'm against the world. Therefore, incompatibility with peace. Do you get the point? How one is incompatible with the other? Humble people are always learning from other individuals. It doesn't matter what kind of degree they have, where they come from, they have this propensity to always learn something new. Actually, there is a story about this uh, lawyer and teacher. And the lawyer was trying to impress the teacher and the teacher was trying to impress the lawyer. They were falling in love, but they found a very rude way to impress one another. They got into this boat and the boatman started crossing them, crossing them to the other side of the river. And as they're crossing them, the lawyer wanted to impress the teacher. And the lawyer looked at the boatman and said, Boatman, do you know anything about the law? And the boatman said, Well, I am so sorry. The only thing I know in life is how to get this boat from side A to side B. I never read anything. I don't know nothing about the law. And the lawyer laughed at him, looked at the teacher and says, well, boatman, you have lost half of your life. And they both laughed at him. Now the teacher wanted to impress the lawyer, look at the boatman, boatman, have you, how many books have you read in your life? And the boatman said, I am so sorry. I haven't done anything but get this boat from one side of the river to the next. That's the only thing I know how to do. And she started laughing at him and left with the lawyer and says, well, you have lost half of your life. But the boatman kept his peace, kept his hope, kept his love. And out of nowhere, this huge ship crosses very near the boat and creates this humongous wave. 
And the boatman is looking at the wave coming towards them. And the boatman looks at them patiently and says, do you guys know how to swim? <laughs> no, we don't. Well, you lost your entire life. <laughs> Anybody can teach us something. Always have this humbleness to learn something new. It is incredible how we lose the opportunity to learn. Therefore, we lose the opportunity to be peace, to have humbleness, to experience love. We go through the moments without realizing how important they are. When people come to us and complain that they're not happy, usually what we find out is not that they're not happy, is it's their lack of awareness that they are happy. They become slaves, either of the past or of the future. They are slaves because they hate someone who have harmed them in the past. Therefore, they live in the past. Or they are slaves of the future because they are so anxious to be happy only when a certain thing will happen to them. And they keep postponing their happiness. And they never experience the present moment. So what you usually find out is that people are, it's not that they're not happy, they lack to experience, they lack to be aware that they're happy. How many times have you asked yourself the question, my God, you know, back in those days I was so happy, but I didn't know that I was that happy. And now that I'm going through these problems, I realize how happy I was. How come we don't experience happiness happiness when it's actually occurring. That's because we lack to have peace, love, and hope within us. It's because what Christ represents, it's still very dormant. It's not in us. It's not born yet. How can we make Christ born within our hearts? To make ourselves humble. By making ourselves humble, I, there's always room to learn there's always room to love. I will experience these emotions. I will experience happiness and peace, which we all crave for. It's not that we're not having problems after we allow the birth of hope, peace, and, ha and, 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 and love within us. They will still encounter. We will still encounter them. But... As we experience them over and over again, just like any other virtue, it will get stronger and one day will take sovereignty over us. Just like Paul used to say, it's not I that live, but Christ that lives within me. It's not that Paul stopped to exist. It means that he allowed himself to fully experience peace, love, and hope within himself. And that's our opportunity. And only us will choose when that will happen. So Christmas will come at any moment of the year when we wise up to understand that it's up to us to make that birthday uh, happen within ourselves. And I hope it's pretty soon because a life is fast fleeting and only you can make that decision. Very easy, my friends, to be happy. It's not difficult. When you allow it, you will experience. At this moment right now, do you realize how many people will crave to be in your position? We are healthy right now. We are sitting in a comfortable place. We're going to be with our friends. I know a lot of people personally that will crave to be in our position right now. Working in the jail setting, I learned so much. I have this individual who writes for me from prison. He was sentenced already to nine years of prison. He writes me from prison and he says, you know, every summer I spend hours playing golf. And now that I'm here in this cell, I hate golf. And I miss my children so much. I had the time to be with them, yet I chose golf, which means choosing what is secondary, choosing what is unimportant over what is important. 
and we have the chance right now, to, yet we don't experience because we don't allow ourselves to do so. Give yourself the real gift of experience, hope. Pray to be thankful. Do you know why do we pray? Do you know what's the function of prayer? Is to ask, to glorify, to praise, and to be thankful for. Now, does God really need her, he, does God really need us to say that we are thank you for the things that he has given us? Not really. God doesn't need our prayers. We're the one that need to be connected. God doesn't need us to hear, to, to hear us saying, I am thankful for this, I'm thankful for that. It has nothing to do with God. It's about us. Why? When you stop to think about the things that you can be thankful for, you know, let me see the things I can be thankful for. I can be thankful for my health. Boy, I have health. I need to be thankful for a job. Boy, I have a job. Let me be thankful for my family. I have family. Let me be thankful for my friends. I have friends. Suddenly, you realize all the things that you have, yet you didn't notice. When we are miserable, we are so concentrated in what we lack that we don't notice what we have. Therefore, once again, we lack the awareness to be happy. And it's right there within our reach if we have the right mentality. What is Christmas? The day we allowed humbleness to take over so peace, hope, and love can be born within us. And all growth, my friends, takes sacrifice. Sacrifice is to choose something that we should over what we like. To choose, to choose something that we should over what we like. And since I was given an hour, let's wrap it up, because I know you're very hungry. <laughs> but there is a story about this boy who was 16 years old. And being 16 years old, you are constantly anxious about girls. And at his school, there was a dance party. And immediately when he looked at this girl, he fell in love with her. He just stand there looking at this girl the entire night because he knew this girl would never give him any chance to go, go out with him. So just stand there looking at her, thinking, you know, boy, wouldn't I be happy if she gave me a chance? But he never had the courage to go up and actually ask her to go out. So he just stood there for the next three hours. So the party was over, and he was heading home, she was heading home, and suddenly, out of nowhere, he said, you know, would you like to go out with me? She looked at him, and she said, yes without thinking about it. And where are we going? Let's go to this coffee shop. Once they got there, she didn't know why she said yes to his question. He couldn't believe that, he had, that she said yes to him. So both of them were very nervous. And since they were so nervous, he didn't say a word. And he kept, she kept thinking to herself, why in the world did I say yes to this boy? This is unbelievable. Waiter com waitress comes by and asks him, anything to drink? And says, coffee? Anything else? Yes, uh, let me have some salt, please. Salt? Are you drinking coffee with salt? Yes, let me have salt. So now the waitress serves both of them. And she looked at him and says, are you actually drinking coffee with salt? And he said, um, yes. But why? Well, it reminds me of my childhood. You see, my father and my mother, they grew up near the sea. So they bought this house near the sea, and that's where I was born. So every day when she prepared breakfast for me, I always could feel the sea breeze coming into the house. So whenever I have coffee with salt, it reminds me of my childhood with my parents. She said, Wow, what a sensitive individual. This guy is someone that can say anything to him. 
And they kept having this conversation for hours out of the sod story. <laughs> a whole conversation came out. So much so that they got married and they lived many years together. And he died. So one day she was fixing up his room and she found a letter from him. She opened up the letter and said, sweetheart, I'm not afraid to say anything anymore because I know I'm close to dying. And I need to say, I love you dearly from the bottom of my heart. But I must confess something. I once lied to you. <laughs> you see, remember that first date when I asked you out? I was so nervous that you said yes to my invitation that instead of sugar, I asked for salt. <laughs> and I had to drink it, and I came up with that crazy story about my parents. <laughs> and you believed it, and it worked perfectly well. But the best part was you made coffee with salt for me our entire life. <laughs> but I must say that I could never have this coffee in any other different way. Thank you so much for being you, because I love you so dearly. To sacrifice is to choose something that we should over what we like. To do something for someone else. When we help one another, not just on Christmas, but throughout the entire year, we become this bridge to God. And before, the love, the hope, the peace reach the other person that we're trying to bring, it will flow through us. This is why the more receives the individual who chooses to give. By you giving of yourself, you allowing yourself to be this bridge to God. This is the message of the highly evolved spirits in the moment of Christmas. The hands of Chico Xavier, Umberto de Campos, that Christmas is not a particular day, December 25th, but a moment that we allow ourselves to have humbleness so hope, peace, and love can be born within us. So this is why a writer that was only 24 years old comes back through the hands of Chico Xavier and writes a poem that synthesizes the entire history of humanity, our purpose in life, our goal towards God. When he writes a poem entitled, March On, life has its mysteries, encompassed of laws of beauty, which compels us to evolve. From God we emanate, multiple forms we reincarnate, longing for perfection and love. In humanity we seek the truth from many myths yearning for peace and evolution. We cause in our path the multiple lives and deaths, victims of our own disillusion. From the eternal struggle, building ourselves from the rubble, we learn ways to overcome. Despite the pain and misery, nevertheless, we grow ceaselessly from darkness to dawn. From the raindrop, a plant reaches the top, triumphant at last. The root appears to be gloom, but manure converts to perfume, transmutation at its best. The plant will be crowned with flowers all around, birds opera on their arrival. But flowers too shall pass, their martyrdom is a bless for the ground's revival. From nature we are taught, work hard, that's the law, all life is in movement. Sculpting through sacrifices, we'll carve blocks of vices. Inside a stone lies a monument. Lessons from suffering and pain. Change will always reign, even narrows, tyrants without seas. Under the law of reincarnation, through many trials and expiations, we'll too be messengers of peace. Let no one be idle. Today's angel was yesterday's Adam. Perfection is everyone's destiny. Life's purpose, splendid. God's love, transcendent. Our school, universe's eternity. On earth, from time to time, sublime beacons of light 
dissipates the shadows away. Their presence are felt for heaviness they dwell, transforming night into day. Never in history a sacrifice such as the one portrayed by Christ transpire for the sake of truth. From the cross the message is heard, forgive all, always serve, your pain I will soothe. It's Socrates and the hemlock, it's Caesar's war being fought in flaming oppression and tyranny. It's Celine and his art, the imperialism of Bonaparte in framing oppression and cruelty. It's Dr. King's I have a dream, Lincoln's speeches never seen. The incarnation of renovators is the embodiment of humility. From the charitable Francis of Assisi, the gospel resuscitator. Blessed be the teachers who illuminate the seekers, inspiring virtues and light. Bliss is yours to conquer. Although perfection is yonder, <coughs> your progress is bright. In the entire universe, Divine heavenly verses decree, march on. A celestial love awaits. Have hope, love, peace, and faith. Perfection, infinity is yours to come. Thank you, God, for the blessing of speaking. Thank you, my friends, from the Inner Enlightenment Spiritual Society for the invitation. You, Angie, for the presentation. And you all, thank you for listening.